Welcome to Hobbs House Bakery. Um, so as part of the Real Bread Week, we um, are going to be answering some of the most commonly asked questions regarding your, how to maintain your sourdough starter um, through to what to look out for when you take your bread out of the oven. And um, so, yeah, so hopefully we'll dispel some of those myths, give you a few hints and tips and, um, and help you continue on your sourdough journey. So lots of people use our sourdough starter, but what flour is it and why is that so good? So um, all our bread is made with our sourdough starter, our mother, that's um, made with uh, a dark rye flour. And um, so before we had a gluten-free loaf, um, we made all our bread um, with the rye so that we could maintain one starter and so that it could go in all the, all the breads that we, made, we make. Um, and it's, because it's uh, dark rye, it contains the, the bran of the grain and, um, and so that's lots of food for the wild yeasts to consume. So it's quite an easy, I would say, quite an easy starter to maintain. But we have had people who take our starter and add other flours um, to it. So if you took your, your rye starter and, and wanted to um, add whole wheat flour to it, then you could, you could do that and continue to do so, or similarly with white flour. But what I would um, not advise is to mix the flours that you add. So you know, if you want a, a, wheat, a whole wheat starter, then, um, then just keep using whole wheat rather than um, changing it every time you feed it. So, because that will then affect the final loaf that you, that you make. And it's quite difficult to, um, to keep up with what ingredients you have in your flour if you're kind of constantly changing, chopping and changing. So decide what, what starter um, you want to maintain and, and I would say stick with it. And um, so how do you keep your starter strong? Um, so when, you, when people ask us, Strong, I guess it's meaning lively and healthy and and it's going to make you a uh, really good bread so I suppose you need to bake regularly so the way to maintain a, a good healthy starter is to uh, use it often so if you take your your starter and you put it in the fridge and then a month goes by and you haven't done any baking it's not to say that you'll have, um, you won't be able to make bread with it, you will be able to make bread with it, but what it, you will need to do is give it a bit of TLC, so, and take it out of the fridge, give it a feed, it might even need a couple of feeds just to sort of get it going. So really, the most basic way to, keep, to maintain a strong starter, a healthy starter, is just use it. So in the bakery, we're feeding and using the starter every day. So, um, so that's what helps keep it nice and lively and healthy. So we often get asked, people who think they've killed their starter. So <laughs> yes. how can people tell if it has died and what to do if that happens? Um, so I think um, from looking and, and sort of keeping an eye on, on Sao Donation community page, that is a very common question is, um, and people, throw their starter away thinking that it's that it's dead and actually it probably isn't um, so how do you know um, very often if your if your starter is left um, without baking with it for, for some time you'll find that you get um, a liquid on top um, known as baker's hooch um, and your starter is still absolutely fine you just stir that in um, and I guess the the way the easiest way to know is um, take it out of the fridge and feed it and, um, and see what happens. Um, if uh, You'll know um, because you can't even necessarily go by the smell as such as because it can get quite, if it's been in the fridge for some time, it can, the smell can quite, get quite acidic and, um, and so some people sort of say pear drops or even nail polish remover, you can get that sort of smell, but that's not to say that it's, it's dead, it's just um, quite um, acidic. 
So it means that um, the best way of knowing whether or not it's, it's dead is, is actually to try to feed it. But I wouldn't suggest you feed it, um, just maintain a small amount, so maybe take 50 grams um, or even less than that and feed it. So, you know, if you think it might have died, don't waste loads of um, precious flour by feeding up a, a big starter. So just take a little, a little amount and feed it and just see what happens. Um, so someone has said that they have a bubbly starter, but their bread isn't in leafy structure. How could they improve that? Yeah, so, um, so you're having a, a lively starter is a really good start. Um, so if you've got lots of, um, if your, your starter's fermenting really nicely and you've got loads of uh, yeast activity, then that's obviously a really good start. Um, but it's not the only, um, the only thing you need to look out for. Um, and, um, and like with, with all things sourdough, there's no one answer for, um, for how to get that structure. And for some people, they don't actually want to have a really open crumb and open texture because they find that you know when you put your butter and your marmalade on it, um, it, it, it falls through the holes. So it's not something that everyone's, everyone searches for, that open, open structure, um, open crumb. But, um, but there are some key things to think about once you're, once you're making, making your sourdough. So, so what you want to make sure is that the gluten is fully developed in your, in your, um, in your dough, in your loaf. Um, and, um, and so and what we, we mean by that is, is if it's... Um, the, the gluten structure is quite weak, then, um, then it won't, um, when you come to bake your loaf, you'll end up with quite a, quite a flat loaf. Um, so if you want a nice, lovely, open texture, then developing that, that strength. And the strength will depend on the flour you use as well. So you need to think about well, what type of flour am I using? Um, what's the uh, percentage of protein in the flour? So do I need to, to maybe add extra um, for need it, need it for a little bit longer, or if you're doing stretch and folds, then do an extra stretch and fold to just to um, to increase that increase that strength. Um, so the other thing I would say is look at the level of hydration. So how much percentage of water am I am I using in my recipe um, in comparison to the to the flour? Um, so when you use less water in your dough, it will give you a much tighter um, tighter dough, and so um, a tighter crumb structure, whereas more hydration, more water will give you um, more elasticity and um, extensibility. So will give you a more open texture. So have a look at your have a look at your recipe. And the other thing you'll you need to look at is is my dough overproved or underproved before um, before I'm baking it. Um, and underproving and overproving can at the finished loaf can give you similar um, crumb structure texture. Um, and so it might not be completely obvious, it, depending on how much how much bread you've baked. But overproving, so it looks if you're if you're uh, proving it in in a banneton or in a basket, and um, and you know it's it's nicely risen. When you turn it out, it just collapses, or you put it in the oven and it collapses a bit like a um, a popped balloon. Then that can be a sign um, that your dough is overproved. And so by collapsing, you, um, you end up with a sort of tighter crumb. And again, with, with underproving, you can end up with a, a closer texture, tighter crumb, because it hasn't um, uh, reached its, its maximum fermentation. And so you, again, you don't get that open, open structure. So, um, so sadly, as I said, um, there's no one answer, but what I would say is make, make some incremental changes into your recipe. Try not to make too many changes in one go and make a note of those changes. And, um, and that will, will help you understand what's, what's happening and why um, you might not have had that, that open texture that you're, that you're looking for. But I always think, well, actually, okay, it might not have been quite the perfect loaf that I was looking for, but it's still gonna taste delicious. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much, it'll come. And what about incorporating things into your sourdough, like olives or seeds or any other flavours? 
Yeah, so you're going to want to um, add things into your into your bread, your dough, just to um, to make it interesting. So um, the thing I would I would suggest is that you think about the addition that you're making. Is it wet or is it dry? And um, and so if it's you're adding something wet, then that's going to make your dough wetter. If you're going to add something dry, it's going to make your, your dough drier. So we were specifically asked about adding olives into, um, into your dough. So I would make sure that the, the olives are well drained. If they're marinated olives in olive oil, then make sure they're well drained and um, so that you're, you're not adding too much olive oil. Um, but if you, if you do add olive oil, then yes, you would need to measure that. If you wanted to be more specific, measure the amount and, um, and reduce the amount of water that you add. Um, and equally, if you want to add, so seeds, um, you can soak your seeds before making your dough um, and then the soaking liquid that you soak the seeds in will be um, taken out of your measured amount of water. So say for instance, you, you, um, you are using a litre of water for your dough and you took 300 grams and soaked your seeds in that 300 grams, then that would that would count as part of your, your litre of, of overall recipe uh, water. So, so just think about whether something is wet or dry. So something, you know, it might seem, might seem obvious, um, but that will, yes, affect your, um, your hydration. So you will need to think about how, um, how you do that and whether or not you need to adjust the amount of water in your, in your overall dough. Um, and so the other thing about when to add to make your additions, so there, again, it, it very much depends um, whether you're doing a stretch and fold method or whether you're doing a more traditionally kneaded method. If you're going to add seeds to um, a kneaded method, then I would add those at the, at the end, at the, the sort of the last um, part of the kneading, because um, it, um, and they can act like little, particularly if they're unsoaked, act like little razor blades and so um, damage the, the gluten structure and also can be quite, quite hard on your hands. Um, and with olives, again, probably end, add them at the end so that they don't get too, um, too uh, pureed up. So if you want nice big whole bits of olive, then add them towards the end so that when you cut your bread, um, you've, got, you've got nice, nice bits of, of olive all the way through rather than um, affecting the, the color of the bread and the texture too much. Um, or you can you could roll them, roll olives into the bread at the end and, um, and so when you slice it, you've got olives through the centre in a sort of Swiss roll effect, if you like. Um, you can also, going back to seeds, you can uh, roll your shaped dough into seeds before putting it into a, a tin or a banneton. So that's another way of getting seeds. I quite like um, sesame seeds. So when you bake, you get those really lovely toasted sesame seeds on the outside. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can make those additions, but just think about um, are they wet or are they dry? And that would be the first question to ask as to whether or not you need to add a bit more water or, um, or less water. Okay, so the last question is the one we get asked a lot, is that people's loaf is flat when they turn it out. What are your tips for... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, so there's, again, there's, there's sort of several reasons um, that your, your loaf might be a bit flat. Um, and so, yeah, some people call it a cow pat or a splat. Um, and yes, um, it's probably happened to, to us all at some point or other. So as I mentioned earlier on about, um, about developing uh, the gluten, so you really need to make sure that your, the, the gluten is, is fully developed um, to give your dose strength. Um, and um, so if it's not, and I think this is probably can be more common when doing stretching and folding rather than uh, more traditional kneaded loaves. Um, that you, if you know if a recipe said do four stretches and folds over a period of two hours, say for instance, um, and that's all you do, but you're, um, it's recognizing when your your dough is ready. So just because a recipe says do four stretches and folds if when it comes to that point where you then leave it to, to bulk ferment, it doesn't look as if it has enough strength and it's, it's kind of putting an extra stretch of fold in should you need it to, to help it that strength. And ultimately, when you bake it, 
if it doesn't have enough strength when you turn it out it will um, it will just basically relax um, another reason is that um, when you're shaping your loaf, um, if you don't put enough tension onto the outside of the uh, outside of the dough when you're when you're shaping it before you put it into the, the tin or the basket, then again it it um, it won't maintain its it won't kind of contain all the the dough inside, and so again turning it out will will spread. Um, and I know overproving can be quite a um, a common um, feature in that as well. So again. Looking, it looks really, really well risen in the basket. It looks, ah, oh, it's looking great. Turn it out, and um, and it just literally uh, pours out onto the um, onto the baking stone or the tray. So again, it's um, just recognizing those signs. So if it's really unstable when you when you if you're doing an overnight proof or if you've just left it on the side, um, then. You need to be aware of the temperature of your room as well, because just because something um, took I don't know six hours, say to um, to prove one day, uh, it might only take five hours the next day if you had an increase in temperature. So so think of temperature as a as an ingredient as well in your in your recipe. So knowing the temperature of your environment, if you haven't got um, you know, a prover where you can set the temperature and you're just relying on room temperature, then you really need to be aware of, of, um, of, of how warm your kitchen is. Last year in the summer, um, the cookery school here was 31 degrees. Um, and whereas, you know, over the winter, it's been really cold in here, so it's been about 11 degrees. So you've got, you know, a 20 degree difference and that's going to make a massive difference to uh, the fermentation time. So bear that in mind that you need to alter uh, your um, your recipe, if you like, uh, the amount of time that you, you give your dough to, to rise depending on the temperature. Okay. Um, I think the last thing was actually just um, when it comes out of the oven, uh, some people have, have been uh, noticing that the dough can be a little bit crumpety, a bit kind of gummy. Um, and, uh, and that can be a number of things as well. So it can be, with higher hydrated loaves, they can come, uh, come over as being a little, bit, a little bit gummy, a little bit crumpety. Some people quite like that texture. Um, it can be the type of flour you use as well. So something like a rye um, will give you a more um, gummy, gummy texture. Um, it might need, mean that you just need to bake it a little bit longer. And, it, and again, it might be that it's overproved, underproved and sort of slightly underbaked as well. So it might just be a combination of, of different things that will, um, will give you uh, that texture. And the other thing just to, although how it's, it's tempting to, um, to cut your bread pretty much as soon as it comes out of the oven, um, another reason for it being slightly gummy is, is cutting it too early. So try, if you can, try and leave it for about um, an hour before, before cutting. If it's a, a purely rye loaf, then you need to give it you know, longer than that, just so that the gluten sets before you slice it so you don't, um, you don't crush, crush your beautifully made loaf that you've lovingly nurtured over you know, several days. You want to make sure that it's um, the best that it can be. Anyway, hope that all helps, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>